I've been asked to say a few words about what Lourdes has meant to Rosalind and me over the many years we've been coming with Stonyhurst. So I thought it would be a good idea to ask Rosalind first what it was that has inspired her to go to Lourdes so many times. Without hesitation, she replied by telling me about the emotion she felt on the cross-channel boat on the way home after her first pilgrimage in 1966. Her Catholic faith, she said, which was somewhat routine after her convent education, suddenly came to life. In Lourdes, she had the experience of being with people, old and young and from a variety of backgrounds, who were willing, openly and with complete trust, to tell her about their troubles and anxieties, and who were willing also to explore their faith and talk about it and what it meant to them, all without inhibition. Her young eyes were opened to another world, a world where, as a nurse, she gained a completely new perspective as she encountered the tragedy of sick and disabled people whose condition was incurable and permanent, unlike the patients she nursed in Westminster Hospital, whose illnesses were usually curable and temporary. And on top of all that, she had enjoyed a great deal of fun and laughter among her fellow pilgrims in the Stonyhurst group, arising from its marvellous team spirit. For her, at that time a 21-year-old, Lourdes was a complete and unexpected revelation. And as she reflected on that first pilgrimage, looking out to sea on the boat on the way home, she resolved to go again. And she did go again, the very next year. But this time it was with me, the two of us together as a married couple. You see, she and I had met on that 1966 pilgrimage and got engaged not long after. Needless to say, after the second pilgrimage in 1967, our subsequent pilgrimages to Lourdes were interrupted for a while by the arrival of children. But looking back now at the age of 86, a careful countdown of our pilgrimages with Stonyhurst reveals that Rosalind and I have been to Lourdes 40 times in the last 55 years, from which it will be evident that Lourdes has become an important part of our married life. And why was that? Well, as time went on and we gradually became what you might call regulars in the Stonyhurst group, we began to make a growing number of friends, not only in the Stonyhurst group, but also in the Catholic Association, the group of which Stonyhurst formed a part. Many of those friendships have been deep and long-lasting, not just the passing friendship of an annual encounter. Some of those friends, alas, have died, I'm thinking of people like Father Paul McGill, Father Hilary Thomas, Laurie Ryder, Tony and Angela Brown, John Cardwell, Eddie Kershaw, John Holden, and of course I mustn't forget dear Chris Carr, who had died only recently. Local friends often ask us how it is that we have such a long Christmas card list. One reason we tell them is the large number of friends we've been lucky enough to make over the years on our pilgrimages to Lourdes. But what makes our pilgrimage so special, I think, is the fact that we're all bound together by the connection with Stonyhurst, whether it be as OS, or as parents, or as members of the college staff, or as friends and associates of the college living nearby in Hurst Green or Clitheroe. I'm sure you'll agree that that connection over the years has had an amazing impact on the camaraderie of the group. A camaraderie which perhaps is best reflected in the enjoyable last night party. An independent observer watching that party with its various acts and sketches, especially the teasing and fun arising from the awards of the so-called Marias, would be astonished that a hundred or so people of mixed ages, sometimes including our own family, could have created such a spirit of laughter and friendship simply by working together in a common cause for just seven days. Yes, it's that spirit binding us all together in the Stonyhurst group 
that has made Lourdes so attractive to Rosalind and me. But surely we don't go annually to Lourdes just for friendship's sake. Is there not something about Lourdes itself that attracts us? The story, the message, the miracles? Yes, indeed, to all of those things. But that brings me to another reason for our continuing to make Lourdes an annual event, namely the fact that the Stony House Group has always been, first and foremost, a helping group. As you know, the Catholic Association Pilgrimage, which brings the sick to Lourdes, looks to Stonyhurst to provide helpers, such as broncardiers and handmaids, even nurses and doctors. And although it's always important to remember the millions who come to Lourdes, not as helpers, but simply as pilgrims, Rosalind and I have to admit that our motivation for coming to Lourdes every year is to help with the sick. She as a nurse, me as a broncardier. Indeed, whenever we're asked by our non-Catholic friends back at home why we go to Lourdes so often, that's what we would tell them. And our non-Catholic friends would be duly impressed with the idea of helping with the sick, even though Lourdes itself means nothing to them. In fact, they often confuse Lourdes with Lords, the cricket ground. For Rosalind and me, working with people with lifelong disabilities some with terminal illnesses, others who have had an accident or a stroke and can never walk again, brought home to both of us just how fortunate we were who were able-bodied and independent. The suffering we met in Lourdes was a constant reminder that here was another world, a world which in normal circumstances we rarely experienced at home. There's an old Indian saying that unless you walk in another man's moccasins, you will never fully understand him. In Lourdes, while it's true that a helper can't get into the moccasins of a sick person, a marvellously close relationship, one that's often laced with fun and humour, is often built up, such that the helper does in fact come pretty close to getting inside the predicament faced by the sick person. Lourdes seems to have this remarkable effect that it draws the best out of those tending the sick. Somehow, being touched by the suffering they see, helpers, young and old, are moved with compassion. And as they get to know individual sick people better and better, especially when they return to Lourdes year after year, genuine and deep friendships are formed making each annual reunion in Lourdes one of real joy. At any rate, that's what Rosalind and I have experienced. But perhaps the thing we've learned most from the sick is the marvellous spirit of acceptance with which they bear their condition. So, when Rosalind and I were young, Lourdes attracted us precisely because of what we felt we could do for the sick. But as we got older, that work inevitably had to diminish because it was so physically demanding. More and more, as our duties fell away, we have had the time and the desire simply to be alongside the sick, praying with them, chatting to them, hearing about their lives back at home and the challenges they face there. Again and again we've been told how much the sick appreciate the company and the friendship they encounter at Lourdes and how this contrasts with the loneliness, the lack of attention, even the boredom they sometimes experience at home. So even though we're now grandparents and well past the days of heavy duty work, Rosalind and I are still, in a valuable sense I hope, helping with the sick. There's just one other important reason why the two of us have been inspired to return to Lourdes so many times. And that is the story itself. You know the story all too well. It's one in which little Bernadette Subiru is right at the centre. But unlike the story of Cinderella, who ends up marrying the prince and living happily ever after, Bernadette disregards. Indeed, she shuns the fame and the glory that came her way, when all her assertions about the apparitions of her lady in the grotto were vindicated. 
Bernadette's story and the amazing development of Lourdes as a consequence has inspired pilgrimages from all over the world, mostly, of course, Catholic pilgrimages. But non-Catholics and even sceptics arriving in Lourdes by chance, or maybe while on holiday, have invariably been captured by the power of the place. So it was with Franz Werfel, who was a Jew. When he was escaping to neutral Spain from France during the Second World War, Franz found himself in Lourdes for several weeks. Upon learning about the astonishing story of the shrine, he resolved that if he escaped successfully, he would write a book about the place which had sheltered him during those perilous weeks. That book became the world-famous The Song of Bernadette, a book that was so moving that it was made into a successful film. And if you can avoid weeping as you read the last chapter of the book, you're a hard man. I have many other books at home about Bernadette, and they all make the same point, that her personality, her humility, and her unwavering testimony are the ingredients that make Lourdes such a captivating place of pilgrimage. And at the centre of Bernadette's story is, of course, the grotto. That place which, when Our Lady first appeared to Bernadette, was a cold, dismal, deserted spot, but which now, for us, is a place of serenity and beauty. A place where millions have been and continue to be, inspired by its mystery and power. When Rosalind and I are in Lourdes, the grotto is the place to which, above all, we are drawn, especially in the cool and stillness of the evening. And when we're back at home, the grotto is the place and image of which we bring to mind when worries assail us, or which naturally comes to mind as we pray the rosary. An image which includes little Bernadette kneeling there in front of Our Lady, rosary in hand. How could we not be drawn back to Lourdes, year after year, when our imaginations are so often captured by that powerful image of Bernadette kneeling at the grotto, the place of which Bernadette herself said, the grotto, it was my heaven. I believe that as for many, many others, it is ours too.